And I have been asking myself this question, is the church now going through its own passion? Welcome back, everybody. Today is Wednesday of Holy Week. We are on Meditation 136 of Divine Intimacy, and it is entitled The Man of Sorrows. Uh, Thank you for journeying with us through Lent. It's been a real privilege for Janelle and I to serve you this way. And I don't say that just lightly. Doing these meditations is a real personal benefit to me because it forces us together, even as a couple, to sit down to talk about, you know, how is God speaking to us through this? And then we come to you and we share. And uh, so thank you for keeping us accountable and thank you for tuning in. It's a, It's been a huge blessing. Um, and we just want to ask you, if you've been blessed by these videos, to do something. Uh, would you consider supporting us on a monthly financial basis? As you know, these meditations and all our videos are free, accessible, and shareable for the world. But to keep things free, accessible, and shareable, it's expensive. (laughs) It's expensive to keep things free. But that's our commitment to you. And we need commitments from other people to help us in order to be able to continue the work that we're doing. So if that is a possibility to partner with us, we greatly appreciate it. You can head over to canandjanelle.com and the opportunity to support us is there. So thank you so much for thinking of that. So with that, Janelle, what's going on in our household? Well, it's Holy Week this week, so I always have a list of things that we try to do every single day. Um, I follow along with um, Kendra Tierney. She has a book called Catholic All Year, and she outlines how she celebrates Holy Week with her family. Today's Wednesday of Holy Week, so we are going to be doing something called Spy Wednesday, where I hide 30 pieces of silver, so 30 coins, and we read the story of Judas's betrayal, and then the children have to go and find those pieces of silver and then it's up to them whether they keep the silver or they choose to give it away Hmm. Um. that's great (laughs) i don't always know what we're gonna do we've done this before (laughs) but i didn't know that twist at the end oh yeah like they they don't get to keep it they give it away or they get to choose well it's up to them to choose but you know there's always a better choice right (laughs) That's right. Um, And then, of course, we always have like our pretzels uh, that we make every year from Catholic icing. So I like to, you know, tap into a lot of these great Catholic moms who have different ministries online. And uh, we make pretzels, which, you know, obviously have a a faith symbolism to them. And then um, other things that we do, we do make the hot crust buns on Friday. And um, our daughter is actually really wanting to do another mural on a window but we're just not too sure about that because <laughs> it is a new home so we don't know if we want paint all over the windows the thing that we which i'm really looking forward to on holy thursday so tomorrow we um grab all of the plants in our house and we bring them into one space and we kind of recreate a garden of gethsemane and we put our statue of the sacred heart of jesus there and in the evening we have little like you know those little votive candles the electrical ones and we recreate a garden of gethsemane a prayerful atmosphere so that that we can journey with Jesus during um, his as he begins his passion um, after uh, Holy Thursday service. So and you really mass. appreciate that, don't you? That that garden. Oh, I there. love it. It's just like I just I find Holy Thursday the most striking time of the year. I don't know why I just get so sorrowful, even just like when I think about it. Um, just Jesus being all by himself in the garden. Mm-hmm. So. Okay. All right. So today we're going to share with you what stood out to us and why from the readings from Father Gabriel from Divine Intimacy. Let us think of the moment when Pilate, after having him scourged, brought him before the mob, saying, Behold the man. Jesus stood there, his head crowned with thorns, his flesh lacerated by the whips, the brilliant red of his blood mingled with the purple of his cloak that cloak of derision with which the soldiers had clothed their mock king. I looked about, and there was none to help. I sought, and there was none to give aid. One of the things that strikes me is how Pilate is caught between two forces, his conscience and the mob. Pilate knows what the right thing to do is. And I think this is why he's had Jesus whipped. So he knows Jesus is innocent, but he's feeling the pressure of the mob. And so he's caught between what he knows is right and what the people want. 
And sometimes I look at us now and the state of the church and ask the question, are we caving to the mob? There's a lot of pressure outside the church and also, unfortunately, within the church to change the church's teachings to be more accommodating to the world. And I can't help but think about Jesus, who was on that great stage that day, whipped and disfigured. He went into the passion as the King of kings, the Lord of lords, but now he's mocked and he's disfigured. He's still recognizable, but it's harder to recognize him. And I wonder sometimes if this is what's happening within the church. To accommodate the mob, to make our teachings more accessible, the teachings of the church more accessible and likable, we come up with new ways of expressing traditional teaching, all at the aim of accommodation. And so we whip Jesus. And he doesn't look the same, but he's still there, but it's harder to recognize him. I think to accommodate the mob, we sit and we listen, and we listen and we listen to people tell us about what they do not like about Jesus, and why they have left Jesus, and why they have left his church. And all this listening sometimes gives the assumption or presumes that there's good reasons to leave Jesus, when in fact there is none. There's not a single good reason to leave the Catholic Church. There's not a single good reason to leave Jesus. But all this listening and listening can communicate a, f a sense of you're le you've left Jesus for legitimate reasons. And so now we as a church should consider accommodating you. And so we put Jesus on that stage and we ask people, what do you not like about Jesus? And we listen to them tell us all the things they despise about Jesus, all the reasons they can't follow Jesus, all the reasons why the church is wrong. And so then we whip him and we whip him and we make pastoral accommodations. And it's harder to recognize Jesus now. We place Jesus on that stage and we ask this mob, what else don't you like about Jesus? And they tell us, well, I want a blessing, but without, accommodate, without conforming my life to natural law or to, the, or to the divinely revealed truths of the Catholic Church. And so we, maybe we say, fine, and we create new blessings and we whip Jesus and he's still there, but it's harder to recognize him. I think we're listening to the mob too much because the mob only knows one thing. It knows what it does not like, but it does not know what it wants. And it always leads to this response, away with him, away with him, crucify him. That's where the mob leads. The church does not exist to accommodate the mob. The world is called to conform their life to Christ. And I wonder sometimes with these movements within the church that are happening now that we've got it backwards in some respects. And so Jesus is there, but he's whipped and he's disfigured and he's harder to recognize. And I have been asking myself this question, is the church now going through its own passion? And maybe you're thinking, well, Ken, is that even right to say? Well, let's look at the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Before Christ's second coming, the church must pass through a final trial that will shake the faith of many believers. The church will enter the glory of the kingdom only through this final Passover, when she will follow her Lord in his death and resurrection. So what do you think? Do you think the church is going through its own passion? I know that many of you see the state of the church and you're disturbed by what you see, and I think some of this is touching that. One thing that we should not do is 
is abandon Christ when he's disfigured. This is when Jesus needs to be consoled the most. Faithfulness to Jesus and the teachings of his church is what we are called to do. You know, when Jesus stood on that stage and he, and he was before the mob and Pilate is on one side of him, I can't but help think of those who he selected. The future shepherds scattered. And he looked about and there was none to help him. He looked about and there was none to help him. Can we help him? As we go through this Passion Week, can we console him? Can we be with him? Can we offer our sacrifices and our prayers to console him? I think it's easy to get discouraged sometimes when we do look at the state of the church, and I don't always talk about it. But I think it's appropriate in this time of Passion Week because it does seem like there is a passion that's happening within the church. And it seems like Christ is disfigured. And he looks upon to the horizon to see if there is any that could help him. Let it be us. Let us console him. Mm -hmm.